Thank you. Awesome. Well, we will get started uh, with our first of our three uh, superintendent candidates uh, interviews. Um, give you a quick rundown on uh, how this is going to go in format. Um, we'll, at the very beginning, right after I get done, give Dr. Bernier um, a chance to introduce himself, uh, tell us a little about himself, uh, background, stuff like that. Um, and then we will go to three prepared questions um, that we have as a board that all three uh, candidates will be asked. Um, and then we will open it up to other questions from the board from there. Um, also, for our uh, live stream crowd, our YouTube uh, crowd, um, we will be selecting a couple questions off there. So if you are watching and have questions, uh, we'll get those, um, pick a couple of those and ask those of Dr. Bernier. Um, and then any other questions we have. Uh, but with that, we'll get started and I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Bernier. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, it's a great, great school system and I've been extremely pleased by what I've seen over the last several days. Um, I can't tell you the hospitality that's been rolled out both here at the district office and at your school buildings on my behalf, including the chamber meeting. To the Hamilton County greater community in the city of Chattanooga, you have a lot to be proud of um, with the board that's seated in front of me today and the work that they've accomplished in the last several years. From my college graduation through 20 years of educational leadership, my work has been to enhance education as a very focused, devoted advocate for students. If you want to know something about Christopher Bernier tonight, and the community wants to know, there where decisions get made and how decisions get made will always be in the best interest of the children that we are required to serve as public school educators. I started as a teacher teaching US history in a middle school, grew into an assistant principal, principal at multiple levels, both middle and high school, uh, senior director of professional development, ending my um, long-term career in Orange County Public Schools as an associate superintendent in charge of about 43,000 students directly of the 209,000 population, um, over 21 or 30, 21 direct reports in 41 charter schools, um, which you, if you understand the relationship of charter schools in the state of Florida, had no line, no line authority over. I had to work with charter schools based upon relationships. If there's a second thing you want to know about me is I'm a relationships person. When I left Orange County Public Schools and ventured west to Clark County, um, I knew I was leaving an area where if I needed to pick up the phone in Orange and solve a problem, I knew exactly who to call. I knew the head facilities chief, I knew the head of construction, I knew the head of math instruction, I knew exactly who to get to help one of my principals or one of my staff members be more successful with students. In making the transition to Clark, I had none of those resources. The only person I knew was the superintendent who had asked me to leave Orlando, join him in Clark to help stabilize his situation. He is a fantastic leader and I'm blessed to continue to work for him and if this does not work out, I will return to Las Vegas to an amazing job and an amazing um, set of expectations moving forward. But I share that to say I had to build a relationship in Clark and I want you to understand that that's the way Chris Bernier has always operated whether he's moved from a teacher to assistant principal in a new building. When I got my first principalship, it was a very experienced staff. I had to build a reputation. You don't get respect, you earn it. You don't get trust, you earn it. And that's what I work on every single day in Clark and what I would commit to all of you. Because it is a risk to look at an outside candidate. Let's be candid. But there are some experiences in my background that I hope we get an opportunity to explore tonight that I think would be an extreme advantage to you as to where you are currently. I also would like you to know that there's one aspect of me that is non-negotiable, and that is my integrity. Um, I, that is just something as an educator, I believe it's the only thing from a classroom teacher to a principal to a dean of students to a superintendent to a deputy. It's the only thing we have. If we sacrifice our integrity, we cannot lead. And what you need moving forward in the system, which is already on an amazing path, is a leader. So I'll jump a question potentially in the introduction and say, so why Chris Bernier, why Hamilton? I don't apply everywhere. I went to Clark with a three-year plan with the superintendent. It was our agreement. The beginning this year, I would look for an opportunity for myself beginning in July of 2022. Your timeline's a little ahead of that, but he's been very supportive of that process. I've applied in Lexington, Kentucky, about the same size, same size school district, and I applied for the same reasons there that I apply here. 
there's a focused board that understands governance. You understand your role. I've watched your board meetings. I've watched you operate with your former superintendent. It is amazing to watch a school board do the work and focus on what's best for children. You have a strategic plan, maybe second to none, not in terms of its goals and its outcomes and what you've done over the last four years to earn the star ratings that are presented in this room and in your school buildings, but it's the focus of what you plan to do beyond that and how you are so transparent with your community about how you're progressing, good, bad, or indifferent. Those are things that, as you look as a candidate out at a school board and a place to go to work, you see it a lot, but you don't hear it and you don't feel it. In traveling with one of your board members today, I had the opportunity to say to him, I'm listening today to see whether there's a separation between central office and your schools, right? The district makes me do this. I do this because the district told me how to do that. You don't even have that problem. Of the four leaders I met with today and, and, and conversed with and worked with their students and had an opportunity to visit their schools, they see themselves as integrated into your plan. They believe that their work moves the needle on your district strategic plan. What a great place to come to work as a superintendent, where the board is functioning, they know what they want, they have targets out as far as 2023. You have a master plan for your facilities, which are 40 year years on average older. Um, and you have a process on a transparent list of how that's going to be attacked over time. I want to tell you that those are the reasons why a guy from what a small town in upstate New York, right? Three stop lights, two of them go flashing at 11 p.m. It's still that way. Um, that's why I went to Orlando to grow. It's why I went to Clark to take my instructional experience and grow more closely, really mirroring a superintendent role with, with my superintendent as his chief of staff. Um, we, we do a lot of great work there. And then certainly nine months in, six months in, sorry, we had the COVID crisis just like all of you. Um, but it's an opportunity to grow and to work with a board that's focused. And I can't wait for this evening for the opportunity to work with each one of you with your questions, provide examples of my experience, things that I've done. And but I want to say something I said to someone at the, the board meeting, to, the, the Chamber of Commerce meeting today. I know there are people sitting behind me, but they're not my people. I'm not coming with people. If you select me, I'm coming to work with the group that's here in Hamilton. Because Hamilton's doing the work, and the people here are doing the work necessary to accomplish this strategic plan. COVID's been a hiccup for all of us. But you will write yourselves very quickly based upon the leaders and the people I saw today met in the central office and the amazing community partners you have. That's a little bit about me. I'll explore things about my personal life if that's where you want to go tonight. Number of kids, you know, why I do what I do. I'm really looking forward to opening up as a dialogue instead of just, just me continuing with, a, with an opening remark. So thank you all for, again, for the opportunity to be here. It's an honor just to be one of the three. Thank you for that. So we'll go into these uh, three questions that every candidate will get. Uh, the first one um, you kind of touched on with our strategic plan. Please tell us what you've learned about your about the work that has taken place in Hamilton County uh, around the strategic plan. Uh, what would you do to move this work forward, um, or uh, would you scrape everything or and start over um, with another strategic plan? I can assure the community and this board that you do not need a refresh, rewrite. You are on the right path and the right track. Not only are you have very clear stated goals of where you expect to be. I will tell you I'm very impressed with the incremental standard that you're using for growth. I think, and I shared with a couple of board members over the last couple of days, well, last day. It seems like I've been here longer than that. Um, you are doing great work, and if you were going to jump from 30% proficiency to 100%, you're going to be in other, you're going to be in lots of other situations. Your incremental process for how you're going to determine growth and move it forward is a critical component. So no, I won't be bringing a team with me. There's a team here on the ground. I would like to be, oh, I guess eventually I'll be the 12th member of the team. But right now I'd like to be the 10th member of the team with this board and working with the staff that's present to move that strategic plan forward. Whether it's your focus five and the presence you're making there all the way down to 
equitable and your equity and access goals, what you're doing for efficient operations. All the metrics are very clear and they're very well stated. I think school boards get beaten up a lot about not being transparent. As an outsider looking in, this was very easy for me to find all the data I needed on the school district. You do an excellent job just solely on your website. I didn't have to call. I didn't have to make a request for a public record. All I had to do was do the research that you provide to your community and, and you're on the right path. There's things in the way. I was asked a question today about you know, what would I do if, you know, if, if all of a sudden we started to hover at 42% and we couldn't move the needle, then we would need to engage in a conversation with our instructional leaders our members of the central office team and all of you about how we might want to change some of the strategies moving forward, but you are on, clearly on the right path, and that's what makes Hamilton so, so attractive. Um, thank you for that. And just a reminder, if you're watching on YouTube, you can submit questions. Um, people joining us a little later. Uh, we'll grab a couple of those off of there and ask those a little later. Um, so the second question of the three, um, what's the most important first steps a superintendent should usually take in a new district? I can't speak for all superintendents. I can speak for me. Um, I'm, I believe in three things. It's what, I, it's what I did when I went from a principal from one building to another. I did have the luxury of moving from assistant principal to a principal building experienced staff. Then I got the true opportunity of building a school from scratch. I was one of those lucky individuals that got named to build an entire school, name my entire staff. Think that prepped me for the transition to Las Vegas and the transition potentially here, because once I proved myself at Odyssey Middle School, the district really wanted me to move to the, the most traditional, and I'll use the word traditional, and you can define that any way you'd like. Um, they, were, they were very structured when I moved to that high school. And, and they needed to change. And you, and you continue to work, and you continue to work on those types of situations by building relationships, focusing on what people have as strengths, because you have strengths here, and then maximizing those strengths, and then looking for the differences in the holes, or the differences in, in, in where we can expand and get better. Um, I have run turnaround school buildings. I have worked in school buildings that were that were just short of an F and turned around to B's. I worked at an Odyssey Middle School where we were A-rated the entire time, but we worked on closing achievement gaps. And when I left, 99% of the achievement gaps had been satisfied. Um, with the traditional high school, I had to move it from a C rating where people were comfortable with that. I share with you, I also have another thought that I believe in exceeding expectations. Um, sometimes you can run into systems into people that believe good enough is good enough and that's never sorry good enough when you're talking about the future of children you have to move and, 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 and you have to move quickly so there's a lot of experience in, in my background related to what you asked about and um, again I, I open up the door for further expo exploration of some specific things I've mentioned so you can we can get into those programs but I, I, I want to leave time We'll, we'll do that right after this question. Um, board members, if you have questions, just use your light and I'll write you down and we'll, we'll go uh, like our normal way. Um, what do you believe would be the biggest obstacle for you in our school system? I don't see it necessarily as an obstacle, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. It's about building trust and building relationships and having open lines of communication that meet your expectation. If I was to poll you all separately what communication means to you, you probably would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You'd have eight different definitions right now. You know, how I, how I would work with school board member Thurman is maybe different than what school board member Perez wants. It may be different than how school board member Robinson wants to be communicated with. So that's communication is one, one spot. But I think it's building relationships and trust and the only way I know how to talk about trust as a bank account, it's the way I used to work with my students in my school buildings, right? You have to make a lot of deposits before you can make a withdrawal. So I think when you really look at about a transition and moving from um, one location to another, moving from um, an Odyssey Middle School where you choose your own staff, going back to the, the previous question, and, and moving into a, a, a building where you're not well known, that prepped me for Vegas. Vegas was all about digging in. I will tell you, prior to COVID for the first seven months, my job description was Monday through Sunday in the office. 
because it's the fifth largest district in the country. There's no way to learn it Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 5. It just can't be done. And just after COVID, just after, just after the winter holidays provided previous to COVID, I had finally kind of erased Sundays off my go to work calendar. I was still in my own house working on school stuff, but I had committed to my relationship and making sure that she stayed in Las Vegas with me. Um, I committed to her that I would start trying to find more time to be at home. And that led to just prior to COVID, I actually started to carve out Saturdays to be at home too. And then in March, when the governor closed our school buildings, the world changed for all of us. I went back to seven days a week and, and making things happen for the fifth largest district in the coast. So I don't know that it's an obstacle. I think it is a, a matter of earning the trust of the principals, of the teachers, of the classified staff, the support staff, and making sure that central office understands that while I believe in exceeding expectations and integrity is, is non-negotiable and children will always come first, I do believe in happy teachers, happy kids. Because happy teachers and happy kids make happy parents. Happy parents and happy kids make happy school boards. But when the tough decision gets made, I want people to know it will be about children first. So I, I don't know if that answered your question, um, President McClendon, but that building of relationships and trust like, I know who to pick up the phone now and, he, and, and call in Vegas to get something done. And it may not be the chief of something. It may be one or two people down who I know I can get on the phone, make it happen, then call the chief and say, hey, I've given some instruction to one of your employees. Just want you to be aware that we're trying to move forward on an issue. So I hope that works as well. Okay, fellow board members, if you have any questions, just use your light and we'll go that way. Ms. Robinson. several questions but I will only ask one right now what does your cabinet look like if you could build your dream team if you're given this position and you could come in and build your dream team what would that cabinet look cabinet look like your cabinet is also already very well structured I I, I want to get it out because I think it's so amazing when I met the chief talent officer yesterday I it was exorbitantly excited about her title <laughs> um, it's the right title I believe in calling people the right things um, I will tell you also just briefly before we get to the cabinet structure um, the person who sits in your main lobby, right? That's the chief executive officer in charge of first impressions. I know that's not her title, but that's the way she made me feel yesterday when I wandered in. Um, so much so that when I went to the restroom, I brought back her pen because I realized I had stolen it and I wasn't going to get the reputation of stealing district materials and having a pen. Um, a dream team for a cabinet is an open and honest dialogue. I, when I look at my administrative teams as, as a school leader and my administrative teams in, in Orange County, and I'll explain why I don't have an administrative team, the misnomer about a chief of staff is I have no staff, right? I am a, I'm a sole operator who works with the staff that already exists in other divisions and departments. Again, the way I get stuff done is through relationships and under, getting people to understand the need of why we need to do it. But I'll go back to my time as building level principals and my time in Orange County. I need honest, open dialogue. I think the most dangerous thing for a leader is what I refer to as groupthink, where everybody thinks it's a great idea, it's a great idea, it's a great idea, and then you go and implement it and they say something like, well, I knew that wasn't going to work. So you have to build that relationship so that people will challenge your thinking. Um, and that's about being a caring, um, collaborative person who solicits that input. And again, that goes back to trust and relationships. People aren't going to risk that on the first day. You, you, have, to, you have to let somebody challenge you and say, God, I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, I used to joke with my high school staff, again, that very traditional high school, hey, I'm thinking, this was an admin meeting on a Friday morning at 7 o'clock. Hey, I'm thinking about coming in and changing the dress code. And I'm thinking about doing this. I'm thinking about, the, oh, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. That'd be great. And we'd go on into the business meeting, and I'd end the meeting with, if I change that dress code, and I changed the three things I just talked about, this community would run me out, out on the rails. And they were like, yeah, they would. I said, so why are you agreeing with me? I need that back and forth dialogue to be an effective leader. Um, and you need to build those relationships and build that sense of trust that, hey, behind closed doors, we can argue like every good family can argue. But when the door opens and we've collectively agreed to make a decision moving forward, 
We own it together. That's how, that's how I'd go about that process, picking a cabinet and working with the cabinet. Uh, Mr. Perez. Thank you. Uh, I do want to state that I had the privilege of being with you all day, so I've heard um, many things about your, your experiences, and uh, we had many conversations along the way. Um, and I state that just for, for transparency so that, um, but I think uh, one of the things that you've brought up uh, throughout the day um, was uh, very in line with one of our focuses, which is really closing the achievement gaps in, uh, in our Hamilton County schools. We have very high performing schools uh, and we have schools that um, we really uh, continue to, to seek strategies to uh, to, uh, to grow and improve. So can you share uh, with us some of your uh, experiences uh, and actions uh, that you took in, in, the, in, in your past uh, to help close some of those achievement gaps? I'll be happy to. Um, there's a bunch, so I'm, I want to be, be respectful of time. And I, Board Member Perez, I would tell you the honor was all mine. It was a pleasure to speak with you today. And I actually thought when you said you felt like it's been multiple days, it's because you spent a day with me, <laughs> and that's multiple days. So. Well, I do appreciate the dialogue back and forth today in the car and the one missed turn, because we were so engaged in the do document. I'm sorry, I just threw one of the board members under the bus. Um, probably not a good thing to do in your interview. Um, closing achievement gaps is not easy work. Um, it, it requires steadfast focus. Um, go back to those ideas of exceeding expectations, integrity, um, putting children first, making the difficult decisions. Um, I have a track record at Union Park Middle where I took over with one few points short of an F. Um, I shared with your um, exceptional student education department, I got a chance to meet with them briefly in their offices. Just wanted to tell them what a great job they're doing, um, not only in compliance with IEPs, but in changing some expectations of how students with special needs can learn. Um, when I took over that school building, we were literally two school buildings. Um, we were going to be three. Um, we had all of our exceptional ed students in the portables, and all of our regular ed students were inside the building, and there was no interaction. Um, that is not an acceptable educational model for me. And over time of that first year, again, building relationships, learning who my players were, we set out to create an inclusive model. Because the, when you looked at the data from the school building, the students inside the building who probably were a lot like me and you, they were achieving fairly well. But unless we addressed the need of our students with special needs, we were never going to meet the state grading criteria. So we worked on inclusion models. We had multiple faculty meetings where I hung chart paper on the wall and said, describe inclusion as an appliance. I'll give you two statements. True fact. One person wrote, it's like a toaster. When you talk about it, somebody's going to get burned. It's like a refrigerator. When you talk about it, it opens and there's a chill in the room. But getting that information out there and allowing a faculty to deal with those real issues and to then plan moving forward and set an expectation of if you return next fall, this is where we're going to be going. There's lots of, I wasn't chasing people out of my building, I want to be clear. But I wanted them to know that this is where we were going to be going in the fall. And if you, if you want to stay here and be part of this process, we can make a difference. When I left Union Park Middle, we were, one sh we were several points short of an A. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why the superintendent picked me to open the brand new middle school. Um, it was an opportunity to be rewarded for the hard work that I'd put in there. Um, I did the same thing at Boone. The critical component to it, though, at Odyssey closing the AYP challenge and at Boone moving it from a C to an A, is about teachers having real data in real time. We get our testing results in July, and by the first day of school, the dashboards, and at the time FileMaker Pro for one of the schools, so that'll really date me in terms of technology, <laughs> um, were fully embedded with the data. So a teacher knew not what happened last year. They knew if you were in my classroom this year, I knew what your score was from last year. I knew how close you were to moving from a level one to a level two student. And if you were far away, I knew exactly how many points I needed to get to get a learning gain. And it sounds like making chicken soup and it's a recipe, and it is, but it's not the whole focus. But when you move to a state where 
school grades are incredibly important. You want to solve that problem the easiest way you can to draw down achievement gaps. We closed ESE, we closed African American, we closed uh, Latino, we closed everything except those three kids in ELL that, that cost me the 100%, cost us the 100% AYP. If my former PTSA president is listening, and I think she might be, she's going to say he, he just can't concentrate on what he does well. Why does he always bring up something that didn't work out? Um, because that's what drives me. That's what drives me to do the next thing. Those same school buildings were healthy in terms of social emotional support, counselors, both career and college centers. They were strong in athletic programs, the arts. So you can drive achievement gaps and, and, and do the hard work with, with teachers um, as a building level principal without sacrificing what, we, what school really should be about, right? School should be fun for kids. And when I first addressed it, I, and I'll, I'll be quiet because it's a long answer to a pretty short question. Um, when I first addressed it, I remember a teacher coming to me and she said, you want me to teach the African American children differently? And I said, are the African American children performing at the same level as all your other children? And she said, no. I said, so can you answer that question for yourself? And what we learned was that the methods we were using to approach students with learning gaps were valuable to all students. It's why I believe in inclusion models for SLD students. Those instructional methodologies work for all kids. Briefly, worked very hard in 2014 to close disparate practices and discipline in Orange County Public Schools, leading in part, just in part, very small part, because I know my mentor's watching too, to the Broad Prize. Um, Say that again, sir. Led to the Broad Prize, which is what the largest urban school districts can compete for, for closing achievement gaps. Mm -hmm. We worked very, very hard in student discipline not to turn over, I know principals are watching and communities watching too, not to turn over the control of a school building to the kids, but to really look at the disparate treatment and really look at what our discipline practices were so we could get more restorative and get kids back in the classroom as quickly as possible. That included partnering with the faith-based communities and, and working with suspension centers so that when students had to be separated, because sometimes there are things that happen where a student has to be separated for a period of time, but why can't they go to a safe, and, safe environment? where there's a certified educator and a paraprofessional to help them on their work and make sure that they return because their parents have to go to work. Why can't they go to a place like that can be, that can be supportive? So those are just some of the examples of, of, of working to close. And uh, I, I shared one today about gifted, but I hope that'll come up, help come up in another question. Ms. Starman. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I have asked every, and I've been on a lot of superintendent searches since I've been on the board. This is always the question I ask because reading to me is the most important thing. Yes. Uh, reading across the nation is abysmal, and we're no exception to that. Um, what do you see as the biggest problem why we cannot seem across the nation to teach children to read? I know the Cherokee Indians, they're... Um, their literacy rate was 95 percent and I just do not understand why we continue to struggle with this what do you see is the biggest obstacle in the way and how do you uh, propose that it could be fixed I think you potentially can fix reading by grade three with several different strategies we have to be very clear and concise that reading is not easy to teach um, I know there's a phrase out that reading's not rocking, rocket science. I think that it is. Phonemic awareness, understanding sight words, um, really understanding reading comprehension. There's, there's several components to reading, especially the way states assess it. I think the greatest priority in a school building should be pre-K and kindergarten. I'm a huge proponent of getting pre-K going as soon as possible. I know in some of the plans, if I'm reading them correctly, you will have the opportunity as you build new buildings to have other buildings potentially be vacant. That is an opportunity to build pre-K centers because if we can be in charge of pre-K at some level, we can really control what enters our kindergarten. I was able to, with my two 
select very carefully where I placed them for pre-kindergarten when my wife went back to work. It, it, we, we were very, very particular. I think we put more effort into pre-K and kindergarten than we might have put into at least one college selection. Um, we have to have that same focus uh, as early as possible because you can't blame a parent for what they don't have, right? High schools blame middles, middles blame elementaries, elementaries blame pre-K, pre-K I guess blames parents, and I don't know who parents play, blame, I guess they have to blame God. I, I don't know who they blame. You can't have that blame game. You have to intervene early, even if it means in some cases in some of the programs that we've run in Orange County and I'm working on potentially doing in Clark. And I'm a social studies teacher, so what I'm about to say may not be popular, but Science and social studies and mathematics can come. Math and reading have to be done K, one, two, three. But social studies and science can come once a student can read. So if I'm a kindergartner, I'm progressing with my reading and I'm staying on grade level, fine, let's get into science. Let's get into the reading of social studies. Let's, but if I'm struggling, we have to make a determination of what we want our third graders to be. Because our third grade scores, to use your Cherokee Indian example, the, Uni the University of Maine has done multiple studies. They determine the number of prisons bed they need, prison beds in the state of Maine based upon their third grade proficiency scores. They know exactly what the trajectory looks like for a third grader, and so do I. I know what it's like to get a sixth grader who can't read the textbook. I know what it's like to get a ninth grader reading at the fifth grade level. The academic content starts, and they have no ability to keep up. So what do our teachers do? They do the right thing. They try to meet the child where he is, or she is. But what they're really doing is a disservice because they've been provided a product that we should have done a better job with early. So extreme early intervention, district-run pre-Ks, not shutting down hands to hands, or you know, love your child or love our kids daycare in downtown Chattanooga, I'm not saying that. But we have an opportunity, potentially, to use our facilities to develop our own pre-Ks. Because if our children can go to school in kindergarten already knowing how to read, why can't everybody's? And then I started a program in Orange just before I left. It goes early, early. We targeted some of our hospitals. Florida Hospital, ORMRC, ORMRC, Orlando Regional Medical Center. Um, and we provided baby baskets when children were being born. It had a little bib, future OCPS graduate. It had some books in it for early reading. And they had vouchers so that when the ch children moved beyond those early reading books, they could come back to a facility we had where we had additional reading books for the next level. So the parents were receiving help and support beginning at birth. We couldn't do it for every child being born, clearly. But we could begin to reach out and really begin to work with parents the, the importance of reading. And, and, and because third grade's the key. I, I, and you are making great progress in third grade, um, at least as a whole. There's incremental progress each and every year. But what you're after are numbers by 2023 that exceed that 50% level. And I think as a superintendent, that'd be tough to explain to a parent in group and as a, as a Cooper member, how we're okay with only 50% 50, 50 of our third graders being able to read. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Winkie. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Bernier, I, um, so when we had our last superintendent search, um, and I, I may have communicated this to you yesterday um, in our short uh, time to, to visit together, you know, in my opinion, we needed some drastic change. We were, we were uh, struggling in all areas, and um, I was thankful that um, the focus as we um, hired a new superintendent was uh, to become academically sound, uh, have, a, have a foundation for academic success uh, that could be sustained uh, and would uh, also progress. Uh, but, but I also uh, am uh, keenly aware, and as you said, uh, you know, there, there are so many other facets to um, healthy, healthy schools yes. and, uh, and, and at all levels, primary and secondary. Um, so my, my question to you, um, outside of the obvious, uh, the academic metrics that, that we've, you know, determined that we want to see and, and see our school system uh, incrementally uh, achieve, 
what do you think are some other signs of a healthy school system? What, what, are, what are signs, um, not just as someone who would be working on the inside of that system, but that, that communities look to and, and they know that those are, that's a healthy school, that's a healthy school system? I think there are a number of different things you can look at, and you're already looking at some of them, so I want to give credit where credit is due. I think the student satisfaction and the parental satisfaction surveys, I have not seen the number of respondents, but based upon the statistics that I've seen, you're doing the right thing by surveying your community and finding out what they think. I think the other aspect, and I met a young man today who's a member of your board, um, who's challenging um, President McClendon for his position. Um, we joked about me being here long enough to um, see him actually join the board presidency. So I think one of the things that you've seen and one of the things you've done here is one of the health, one of the healthy pieces of a school system is longevity of board members, is longevity of a superintendent. Every time a superintendent turns or changes, is, if it happens a lot, faculty, principals, school leaders, central office staff say things like, oh great, here we go again, right? Somebody's gonna, five, he's gonna make it five years, we're gonna have somebody new. I shared with as many people as I can, both in the community over the weekend that I met, in grocery stores and other places. Do you have kids in the school system? My hotel clerk today. I, this, I want this to be my last job. I really do. I, I, I spent a long time in Orange and wanted to stay there. Took the opportunity to grow and develop more. But I, I want to get that out into this question. Um, equity and access points. Um, School systems can be determined about their health, about equity and access. And what I mean by that is the access to pre-K, the access to gifted um, is, a, is another measure of how many students are we're losing in a pipeline moving towards a college and career pathway. Um, the number of students who are able to access rigorous middle school level courses, meaning high school credit in middle, that's another way of looking at access. Um, because then that frees up a high school schedule to start with AP classes, international baccalaureate, Cambridge programs, dual enrollment, um, I might get it wrong, ESOPs, the early career and technical ed. Um, those, are, those are critical components of, of the health of a school system. Um, I'll turn back to Phil Ziegler, who was my head football coach at Boone High School, who told me if I can win a state championship, you'll never have a problem with student discipline until January because by the time we played for a state championship was December. Um, he's right. The year we played for the state championship, we got killed. But the school building was rallied around that football team. That's another sense of health of a school building. Um, the clubs, how diverse your clubs are. Um, there are multiple ways to measure the success of a school building other than a star rating or an A to F grade from a state or however, however the state determines that. Um, it's the health of a culture. It's the focus on a student believing that every day they walk to school, at least one adult in that school building cares about them. I, I never cared if it was me. Some kids didn't like me. I was like mosquito repellent. I got a group of middle schoolers gathered direct, and I walked towards them. They scattered like I was sprayed with off, right? But they went to somebody else, or they went to the custodian, or they were in love with the cafeteria lady, or they loved my school secretary. And by adopting our kids, and really driving, you know, that we cared about them, that's another big healthy aspect. The arts, how, how, how big is the band? How big is the strings program? What does the marching band look like on Saturday? And does everybody vacate the stands when they play to go get a hot dog or do they stay and they listen, All right? Because those kids work really hard. And, and those are all aspects. But I think one of the ways beyond the strategic plan that you have that you can do it is really looking at the access that students have, and not just how much access, but I'll be candid. What do they look like? Do they look like me, or do we have real access where multiple students are getting the opportunity to, to work to their few, full potential? Your, your strategic plan does not say some students. Your, your, your Hamilton promise does not say some students. It says every. It says all. So that's another way to look at healthy school buildings beyond just how do we do in third, third grade reading, ACT, grad rate? But I think grad rate is, is one of the best measures of a healthy school system. When I was in Orlando, when I hired on, we were at 55%. Um, when I left, we were just short of 95% in our traditional high schools. Um, I know how to get that work done. And, and it's about healthy school buildings and school buildings that care about their children. 
You're welcome. Ms. Hill. Thank you. Um, I've enjoyed getting to hear from you um, yesterday and then today at lunch. Um, and I appreciate what you've shared about moving subgroups forward. I mentioned that was something I was going to ask you about, but we've, we've really dug into that. So another um, thing I'd like to know from you is talk to me, talk to us about your understanding of the Tennessee basic education funding model, the BEP, and what you see, um, where you see opportunities um, for us, because you know, some, some of the ideas you've had, I've, I'm sure some of our board members are like, yeah, but how? So talk to us about, about that. Please. I understand basically how the, Tennessee, the state of Tennessee finances your school buildings. It's not much different than the state of Florida. It's certainly not different than the former funding formula in Nevada. Um, what I'm most encouraged by is the movement in the state legislature to move to a new funding formula, mm -hmm. a, a student-centered formula. It is um, the right way to go about um, financing school systems because kids come in with different needs. All ESE children, students of special needs in former systems have different metrics, different weights. So you have a standard FTE that's provided to all children, 1.0, you can multiply anything by one, you know what you get. But then certain students get additional weights. Um, 251 funders like an SLD student who may have dyslexia may be a 251 funder. So they get a .5 added. So not only do you get the one full FTE, FTE to educate that student, but you pick up a .5. Um, 252, 253, 254 funders, in some cases in 254 funding, you're looking at a multiplier of three. So you're getting the full FTE, that one full FTE, about $10,000 in the state. Um, and, but then it's multiplied by three. Um, and it's why principals like myself consistently raise their hand because I believed in it um, for autistic units. I wanted the autistic kids. Number one, I believed they were a value to my school building. But after I did everything I needed for them, bought all their curriculum, set them up in the home rec room, got them the two teachers they need and the three paraprofessionals, we still had money. Um, I was talking with a PTA mom today at the chamber because she asked me what, what could she advocate for our school board um, in Tennessee related to the funding formula. I said they, they have to really think about weights. They have to think about that some children cost more to educate and you need additional staff. You know and I know that the greatest percentage of your budget is spent on people. It always will be. Um, but we have to find a way to, and, and ELL students, and they, they have a weight in the funding formula. And then that has to be driven down to the school. It really has to be driven down to the school. And one of the things that I would advocate that the state of Tennessee needs to be careful of, and, and your government relations group, or whoever works with the state legislature, um, they need to be careful of the state legislature thinking about, um, oh, well, they get Title I, and they get Title II, and they get Title IV. So they could use that so we could lower the rates. We could lower those weights for particular children. Um, that was my, she said, what could I take? I said, that's the one thing that people have to look out for. We can't, and I know it's against the law, but, so I'm using a word that really doesn't reflect. You can't substitute, I was gonna say supplant. You can't substitute federal dollars for what a state should be doing to fund the students. Um, and to your point about board members saying, great idea, but how? You make decisions, right? Um, as a former middle, and high school principal and as a former associate soup with multiple schools, as a former, you know, working with learning communities as well. Principals and school districts spend money on what they believe is their priority. Mm -hmm. They really do. If you want to know what a school board and a school district and a school principal believes in, look where they're spending their dollars. And if they're spending it on the right things for teachers and additional staff, and making sure that kids are achieving, that they have strings programs, that they have new, what did I get hit up with at Boone? Trombones. The, I was on there a week when my band director said, we don't have trombones in 20 years. All right, I'll see what I can do. My deal with budgeting is always to say, gosh darn it, I don't know that we have the money for that. Then I'm gonna work my tail off with all of you to find the money to do those things. Because if it's our priority, we can make it happen. You may have to 
stop doing something else. But, but you can meet the priorities in, a, in any type of funding model from any state. Thank you. Ms. Jones. So earlier you were talking about, um, when Marco asked the question about um, the closing achievement gaps and, and some of the ways that you did that, um, you mentioned, get back to my notes, you talked a lot about um, inclusion, SEL, um, SEL, um, pre-K inclusion. At the chamber today, you talked a lot about um, those same things. You also talked about representation um, mattering in school buildings, for, in, the, in the curriculum, in the educational process. So um, here in, in Hamilton County, we have um, some schools that were priority schools that are, um, have worked really hard to, to, to come off of that status and are very close. One is off and the others are very close to coming off. We, of course, have had to make those um, additional investments in those school buildings, such as you spoke about earlier, where you can't educate every child at the same dollar amount, so forth and so on. What, um, can you talk to us a little bit about how um, or what innovative ways you were used um, or advocate for using to help those schools that are still somewhat underperforming to um, improve, but also in sustaining um, the schools that have uh, come off or working to come off um, to keep them that way. Right, the danger, I, I think if I'm, if I'm getting the question, the danger of turnaround leadership is you can turn it around but and everything starts to move it? forward, the additional dollars disappear and they fall back. Right. Um, I'm proud to tell you that Union Park Middle, that, that school building I work with is still A and B graded. It, it, it's a Title I school. It's in a tough part of Orlando. Um, you know, not everybody surrounds the mouse. Um, and I always have to remind people, the mouse isn't even in Orlando. He's in Osceola County. Um, but you, you have to build systems of support that work. What we didn't talk about is how I moved with data. Our teachers worked with something called an individual professional development plan. Um, it has this great moniker of it called an Ippy Dippy. Mm -hmm. um, you know educators, we love, our, we love our acronyms. But it was an individual, each teacher at the beginning of the year would look at their data and they would make determinations of at the end of the year where they wanted to be with their students. They had the data of where the students were, now where can I get them? They also got to define what they needed for professional development in order to meet those criteria. If my building, if my, my load had changed and I had EL stu ELL students and all I had was the basic ELL certification, which God bless you is a board you're doing for your teachers. That's where it starts. Everybody's gonna understand ELL learners learn slightly differently. And you've gotta approach them differently. But they would set up their own individual professional development plans with a goal related to student achievement. And we used to talk about stretch goals. I used to say things to my teachers like, Failure is an option. You can't get me a zero, but I'd like you to see. I'd like to see a stretch to see what you could pull off with the kids this year. Um, we worked very, very hard to provide them. Then, based upon their issues, we developed professional learning communities surrounding those because they're themes and what the teachers wanted. We then worked within our structures to to build that. Um, so that those teachers wanting that professional development had the opportunity with their own school building to receive it and then work collaboratively in a PLC to work with each other about how they were achieving it. And if one was making better progress than the other, then you cross-pollinate, right? You build systems of support so that when, unfortunately, the, the learning coach or the uh, additional reading intervention specialist goes away, your teachers have been raised up in terms of their practice and maybe they just need to be monitored and maybe that person that was on the staff full time now swings by on a weekly basis or every two weeks to check in, making sure continuing to continue to make progress, make sure the instructional model. And then I shared with uh, board member Perez when we left one school building today, some of the instructional models that were going on in that school building need to be replicated. When I moved to district leadership, we began what we called a district PLC because I was sharing with the principal today. 20 years of cooperative learning. Go into a classroom and try to find it. Everybody's gone to the training. They try it for a little while and that doesn't quite work out because you get what you inspect, not just what you expect. You can have all the expectations in the world of your child and their driving habits. You can have all 
the expectations of the world with a teacher and how they implement curriculum. You've got to inspect it. And what we developed is a district PLC with the help of our teachers determining what they thought was the best way forward because we were stagnated at a C grade. We hadn't moved Orange County, Florida off a C in a number of years. I said today, we squeezed that turnip as hard as we could squeeze it. We got all the juice out of it we could. So we worked with our teachers and within the learning communities, principals then trained other principals and their team, their team went back to the school building to do those implementations of the professional development. And then as building supervisors and principal supervisors, we walked those buildings for the evidence of that. Not as a gotcha, but as an opportunity to grow. Some schools grew very rapidly, very quickly. Others didn't. So it's about creating systems and approaches that didn't cost us any more money. Right? It was the professional development department didn't any more dollars. But it's about building systems of support so when that, those dollars leave or the additional supports leave, the, the patient can, can exist on their own. Um, and, but then it's about physical, I'm, I'm using another adage, but it's about physical therapy, it's about maintenance, it's about keeping those things. And um, some of what you're doing, just in the people I met today, is you have people turning around school buildings, the principal goes off to do something else, but the person coming into their position knows the system, and, and that's the critical component. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Robinson. Okay. <laughs> um, I've got another question for you. Um, so uh, Jenny brought up the BEP formula, and I thought that was a really good question. I wanted to hear more about your experience with budgeting and the finance part of uh, running or you know, being a part of running the school system that you're currently at as the chief of staff. So tell us more about your budgeting experience, what role you've played in that, um, you know, how do you take, how do you approach the budgeting process? I approach the budgeting process from a three-legged stool. Um, there's, there's three aspects to the stool that I believe in talking with Jason Gowdy, who's on my reference list, and I have some documentation for you tonight so that you walk away with a little bit more information about me. I, I'd hope that you talk to Jason. Um, there, there's three, there's three, three parts to a stool for a district, um, and it, it, it intertwines with the superintendent's evaluation because the last thing we want is, is you evaluate me, the budget's already set, then you want a bunch of new educational priorities. Right? We need to make sure that we're in line where I get the, the, the superintendent you hire, sorry, you, you get the evaluation prior to budget. We can talk about budget priorities and we move into budget priorities. The number one priority for me will always be the best programming possible for our children. All right? It'll be about teachers, it'll be about programs, it'll be about professional development and our principals and our school leaders. The next era is, is about compensation packages. This is a competitive market. This is a teacher's world, right? They can go anywhere they want to go. Everybody's got vacancies. And, and compensation doesn't always mean more salary. It can. It can mean a better health insurance program. It can mean additional benefits. It can use, be additional days off. It could be one-time bonuses, depending on whether we have, uh, what, what type of funding we have. And then last but not least, my third approach to, I'm, I'm, I'm a fiscal conservative. I've been through 2006 to 2009 through the recession. I remember going into the deputy superintendent's office and say, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I know how you can save this much money and it's in professional development, which I'm in charge of. So if you look at my resume carefully, when I left leadership development, I went back to a middle school before I came back a year later to be the associate superintendent. We worked very hard to try to get professional development to survive the recession. We couldn't, the amount of cut was too great. So I do believe the third part of a stool is about reserves. So when Jason and I talk about budget in Clark County, when we work with our ESSER funding dollars, I've been knee deep in ESSER 1, ESSER 2. I helped write the use of, I actually wrote the use of funds plans for ESSER 3, which has now been approved by the state and will go to the Fed. Um, and then another great piece of working with budget is I, I I really do enjoy it. It's going to sound crazy, but I'm part of the negotiation team. We have seven unions in, in Clark. We have the teachers, we have the administrators, we have a PAA, which is our, off, our, our administrators, our police administrators union, our police officers union, our classified union, and, and I'm leaving one out. But um, that aspect of working very closely with Jason when we negotiate 
and we look at the three the three percent we gave this year and the three point five we'll give next year. Um, you know, I'm knee deep with Jason on that because it's just a desire for me to learn more and more and more. Um, and I'm I'm not the expert on a budget. I understand how budgets work. I understand what the expectations are. I understand that the bud the difference between a budget and an actual. Right, the actuals were what really are important, um, but I would work hand in hand with the chief, the chief financial officer, and the finance department here. I've gone over your financials. I've gone over them with my CFO. Um, you guys are very healthy, uh, and and you have a good bottom line, and and we would continue to be that way. I I will tell you that as a building level principal, we financed our schools differently than you do. Um, I got an FTE budget based upon my kids, and I had the latitude to make the determinations of how many teachers based upon enrollment. I always held money back in my reserves because if I didn't make enrollment, then the district came knocking and said, okay, you're down 100 kids, you owe us $150,000. No problem, into the reserves, pay back the district, we're free and clear. Because the last thing I wanted to ever do was look in a brand new teacher's eyes who I had just hired the 10th day of school and say, I kind of screwed up the budget. Right, we didn't get the enrollment I expected. I gotta, I, I, you can't work here on Monday. You're gonna have a job in the district, but it won't be here where I hired you. I, I'd rather be in a position on the 10th day to hire more people than to be in a position on the 10th day to let somebody go. So that's more information about me from a financial aspect and what I believe. Ms. Thurman. Yes, a moment ago you said something about, I can't, I was sitting here trying to remember exactly what you said about traditional learning. And you said they needed to get away from that. Exactly what did you mean? What is traditional learning to you and, and getting away from that? Exactly what did that I'm mean? I'm not sure. I'm, 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 I, when you're up here providing the yeah. answers, I sure would go back to the videotape <laughs> well, and I'm going to go, gosh, absolutely But it's gotcha. uh, something about, the middle, right. about one of the schools that uh, I was trying to remember. It was a middle school. Traditional, traditional high, school. high schools. Yeah. Um, I had a very traditional high school. Right, right. And what I mean was it was steeped in tradition. It, it, it still had... It still had policies and procedures in place that were not good for all children. And what we had to do was slowly but surely respond and create equity and access issues. When I first walked that school building and I went to Calculus AB, everyone looked like me and you. And yet I had 30% of my students who were African American. There was talent in my African American children that was not being tapped. They weren't being offered because there were things in place like teacher recommendations to move to the next math level course. From Algebra 1 to Algebra 2, there was a teacher recommendation. So if you weren't recommended, you had to go to consumer math. Well, now you're way off a college and career track. So that's what I mean about some of the traditionals. But sometimes when I say that, I will also add this. Um, there are students who I met even today that can't do the, the 7 to 3. They have responsibilities at home. They're required to work. They are pregnant. They have their own family. Um, they've made decisions. And they've made choices. And, and there are consequences to every choice we make. And, and, and positives to every choice we make. What I spent the latter half of my career doing is finding opportunities for those people. I had a teen parenting program at Beta partnered with um, United Way which gave our girls an opportunity to stay in school, their children in a nursery right in the same building, and to go to school and to have their child and be able to see their child every day at lunch and still graduate from high school. So we, that's how we got to that 95%. I created a school to work program at Universal Studios Orlando where our students split scheduled. In the morning, some of them were working, and then in the afternoon they went to school, and vice versa. In the morning, some of them were in school, at, at Universal Studios on the property, and then they were working. The caveat was they had winter and spring break, summer break, guess what they were doing? They were working. They knew that going in. We expanded that the last year I was there into beyond hourly work. They started, the executive officers started offering opportunities for executive internships for our graduating seniors so they could see animation departments, so they could see the human resources department, so they could see what a CEO does. And, and they brought our kids out of the hourly ranks so they could see what other career paths and opportunities. Partnered with Goodwill to create situations both outside of the traditional hours that allowed students to still get their diploma 
And as our numbers rose, I shared this at the Chamber of Commerce today, uh, we instituted something called Project Graduation. It started sitting around with our chief equity officer and saying, wow, we're at 91%. Where are the other nine? Where are the other 9% of the kids? Where are they? What are they doing? What do we know about them? How can we find them? And we built a program to at really no expense to our principals. All our principals had to do was help us identify them. But we put the central office together and went out and knocked on doors. And we found a student, one of the first students I ever found, needed a half credit in physical education in order to get her high school diploma. Mm -hmm. But she thought since her senior class had graduated, she couldn't finish. Lucky enough at the time to have the Orange County Virtual School in my realm. I could explain at length how you do virtual PE, but we got her the half credit and she walked the following fall, mm -hmm. the following winter. Um, it, it's about finding ways to go after and find our kids. And, and the kids that we start to lose, getting them early before they get too far down a path. So when I talk about traditional environments, it's the environment many, many of us went through. And most of our kids fit into that. But some of our kids are, are square pegs in a round hole. And we have to build the square peg option for them so that they can get to graduation and have that college and career path that all kids deserve. Okay, thank you. Our first uh, question from uh, YouTube, uh, the shortage of subs slash teachers is having a big impact on us. Um, how will you uh, address the shortages if you are superintendent? Uh, as best we can. Um, I met a, a principal today who started with, thank you for being here, I need a few minutes, I, I, well, I'm short of subs. Um, we have met that same challenge in Orange County Public Schools, I met that same challenge in meeting that same challenge in Clark. Um, at one point during the visits today, I was on my phone because we were dispatching central office staff to help support um, our school buildings that were short subs. Um, the day before, this is one of the first weeks ever, this prior week, where we were not off Monday and Tuesday for Thanksgiving. Um, we have went, the students are off on Wednesday um, and then Thursday, Friday. But this was one of the first years we had a Tuesday, Wednesday situation. Um, and we started monitoring our call-outs beginning Tuesday of the previous week. Sunday night, 7.30, we were on the phone. I was in Blue Ridge, Georgia. Um, but we were on the phone putting the plan together for Monday morning. I can't tell you how many text messages I got Monday saying Christmas came early because the central office staff, administrators who had a license, math support professionals, um, you pick your titles. We dispatched them to school buildings to make sure our buildings were covered. Those are short-term solutions. The long-term solution has been to increase pay for our substitutes, um, to increase the amount of recruitment we do to find them. And like you've done with custodians, we are currently in the process in Clark of working with a company that would help us outsource the substitutes and provide us the additional data, I'm sorry, the additional people to go ahead and, 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 and meet our classroom needs. We have that problem with substitutes. Uh, to the YouTube viewer, we have that problem with teachers in general. Um, we have that problem with bus drivers. Um, it's, just, it's just the current environment we're in, and we have to get creative. We've, oh, we've, we've addressed bus drivers by um, in the midst of COVID, which was a risky proposition for us, but we went forward anyway with our board. We are incentivizing our bus drivers to come to work. If they have perfect attendance, um, then there's incentive for that. Um, during periods during periods of time, not a whole year where they have to wait. And then we incentivized, incentivized all of our employees if they could find a bus driver or somebody willing to drive a bus, then that employee received a bonus if that person worked for at least six months for us. So we're doing the same thing with substitutes. We're trying to find ways with our available dollars to try to make these positions as attractive as possible. And I think it comes back down also to compensation packages. We really worked hard this negotiation session with our unions to provide a fair compensation package to reduce some of their health care costs and increase their take home money. Um, and we're paying, at least for teachers, and I'm not recruiting, we're paying very well um, in Clark County for our, for our educators and, and our support professionals finally. So those are just some of my ideas. It's hard, I'm, I'm talking to a person out in the, out in the ether, um, but those are just some of the ideas. There's no magic wand. It's about hard work and finding creative solutions to try to get people 
to step in step into the role. I'm not opposed to getting a CDL license, but I don't think you want me driving a bus. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Hill. Thanks. Um, so we've talked some about high school and getting um, credits um, early. Let's talk a little bit about middle school. Um, you've you mentioned on your resume that you've had some significant success with innovative, the Innovative 8 Middle School Project. And for our system, we have implemented some really um, well-respected, positive programs related to our Future Ready Institutes. Mm -hmm. That's in our high schools. Um, in our elementary schools, we have implemented a new reading curriculum. We'll be um, adopting a new math curriculum. So there's, there's good energy there. But we recognize we've got to look hard at middle school and how it becomes a place where kids are energized, not just waiting to go to high school, right? Um, and where kids begin to have opportunities to connect with what's going to be next for them, what that career pathway might be. So can you please share with us your ideas and what you've seen with innovation in middle school? A couple of programs I'd like to just highlight briefly. And um, I think the aspect of the early intervention programs that you have here in Hamilton are, are mirrored across the country and in my previous experience by providing students as quickly as possible aspects to what the career ladders look like, what industry certifications look like, and you can work with middle school students to get early industry certifications and set them on a track. I think more importantly though, I think it's important that they begin to explore as early as sixth grade what they think they might want to do. Um, I was talking to a middle schooler today. She wasn't quite sure but she thought maybe the medical career was where she was headed and she was aware of medical magnets and nursing programs and other places that she could go to. Um, I think what I was referring to with the Innovative 8, that goes back to the YouTube question. It's an innovative process we did in eight of our schools in Clark where we had teacher turnover rates and retention problems with our teachers. Um, the negotiated agreement with our teachers union allows teachers to be paid a $10,000 bonus for signing on and each year that they stay with the school they continue to get that $10,000. We have seen um, turnover rates and well let's start with fill rates. We've seen fill rates that were at 50 or 60 percent now hover at 97 to 98 percent. So our teachers are choosing to go to work in those school buildings. On top of that they are staying. Our retention rates are somewhere in the 97 to 98% range over the first two years of the program. Additionally, those teachers are rewarded if the school building's student achievement improves. They're eligible for an additional $5,000 based upon how the school moves up. So COVID, we, we, we just met with the board before I left. We're extending that three-year program into a fourth year because we were not able to do performance awards this year. Um, because we had no state testing with which to compare it to. We did, the state of Nevada took a year off in 19. Um, but in terms of another innovation, one of the things, and I'll, I'll, we, I'll credit um, Duval County in Florida, it's, we borrowed it from them. Um, but we built a, a program for overage, undercredited middle schoolers. We had kids entering sixth and seventh grade at the age that they would be 18 or 19 by they went into ninth. Mm. It's just, I mean, I, was, I, I had at one point a, a sixth grade daughter. I don't know that I'd want her running around her middle school with a 17-year-old boy. Right. Um, and, and those numbers were growing, and let me be clear, they were disproportionately African-American and Latino males. Um, so what we borrowed, is my best word, what we borrowed from Duval was an intervention system that we cleared with the state where it was a two-year program to complete middle school. So we could catch kids up. We could do three years of school in two years by blocking them so they didn't run the traditional periods, right? They ran a full day of 90-minute blocks. And semest semesters, they could complete sixth grade in a semester. Then they could move to the second semester and complete seventh grade, that's year one. Year two, they would complete eighth. And then in that second part of year two, that second semester, we started with high school content. Um, we didn't 
push in a full load because the last thing we wanted was a dangling credit. You don't want a kid to graduate at the end of a, a semester with half of an algebra class completed. So we were very careful. And then we chose very carefully school to work programs, um, different types of alternative programs that we had within, within the, the school system. For those students, maybe traditional high school wasn't the right place because they couldn't, they were still facing four years of graduation and the likelihood of them doing it was not possible. Um, what I loved about my middle school experience was really something that m myself and several other principals invented as when I was middle school president was, the, we called it the Great Orange County Teach-In. Um, we brought in people from the community to work with our kids twice a year. Fire departments, I once brought in a furrier, a guy who made horseshoes. Um, you know, we, it, it didn't matter what you did. We just wanted our kids to see at a very early age all the careers that were possible for them. Dog handlers, veterinarians, and it doesn't take long. You all know somebody who would give, all we needed was a half an hour. You didn't have to spend all day at the school, half an hour. And if you told me all the people I was getting, I could schedule all my kids to see all of those individuals and, and, and build a career interest. Um, and then I think something really incredibly important is magnet programs that begin at elementary, fold into middle, and then complete themselves at high school. Cambridge is one area that does that. IB is excellent at that. But you can also do that at elementary. We, are, we, are, we built a foreign language academy at Hillcrest. It's a, what I refer to as a zoneless magnet, full choice. But then that fed into, we didn't have a middle school. So we built middle school the foreign language programs, and then that folded into the high school programs that were already in place. So the kids could grow and see career and academic opportunities moving forward. Um, it, again, it's about systemic processes and, and aligning the work to get to the result that you want. Ms. Robinson. Um, I was curious, your current um, relationship with your funding body in Clark County. Um, so I don't know, are you funded by a county commission or any type of other government body aside from your school board? We are funded directly from the state of Nevada. Okay. The Nevada, the, the state, the state of Nevada, the legislature finances school buildings, and for the first time, we are moving. We've moved this year under a pupil-centered funded formula, and we will move again next year. There'll be another. There's another revision to it, and will be fully implemented in a in a pupil-centered funding formula based on those FTE weights I was talking about earlier. Okay. Um, our model is a little different here. Um, we have a funding body. It's the county commission, and so that's a separate body than the school board. Um, and they have the final say on, on our budget every year. What would you do to build a relationship with that funding body and hopefully move the needle toward um, whatever it is, whatever, whatever vision you would have for our budget well, you have um, a very, as a school system? You have a very unique situation in Hamilton County with Chattanooga as well, and I know that's not the question you asked, but you have a mayoral system in, in the city, and then you have a county commission at the county level, and I'm very familiar with that. Both in Las Vegas, we have the county commission for unincorporated Clark. But we also have the city of Las Vegas, the city of Henderson, the city of North Las Vegas. Those are mayors. Um, and while they don't control our funding, they are um, vocal in terms of, of how, we, how we spend our money. And they were critical as we did the meaningful conversations with ESSER 3. They were vital in helping us host all the community meetings we needed to do with the time frames we were provided. Um, in my experience in Orlando and working in that type of environment as an exact example would be working with the after school programs. So in a sense, we were funded in a way from the county commission. The county commission had something called the Citizens Commission for Children. Um, they sat on very large grants from both the federal government, state government, and from the county government. Um, and that's how we built universal after school programs for elementary and middle school kids. Um, there isn't a student who went to school in Orange County that didn't have before and after school at elementary and before and after school at um, middle school without a cost. Um, summer programming was a little different. There was some cost related to summer program. But we had to work with both the city of Orlando and then Orange County government. And quite honestly, that's about dialogue. Um, I had a great conversation with the chairman last night at dinner about dialogue and how important it is to open those opportunities. I'm working right now in Clark with all of the daycare, I'm oh, sorry, all of the after school program providers. Um, Safe Key, After School All Stars, um, and there's another program out of the city of West Las Vegas that, I'm sorry, 
it escapes me at the moment. But we're working with those organizations to, to drive what we need to do in Clark because the last thing we want to do at 3 o'clock in the afternoon is send a middle schooler home to an unsupervised house in, in an unsupervised neighborhood without parental support. Lots of interesting things can happen when you do that to young people. Um, so we want to make sure there's that help and support that's free to families. And um, we're moving forward with the YMCA, the Boys and Girls Club, and those, those organizations. Um, relationships are about ongoing dialogue, ongoing conversation, determining where your um, needs synergistically come together. Um, because if Hamilton County, looking at your sign, is truly going to flourish as a community, then one of the health points, to your point, about schools is the successfulness of the public education system. If I was an employer thinking about moving to Hamilton, I'd want to know where my employees' children could go to school and what type of environment they would be in. What type of opportunity would my employees' children be able to, to do? If you want your kids, and, and you're doing a great job of it with, with the partnerships that I met today, if you want your kids to stay, they have to see opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and those dialogues are open and you have very active partners who want to be a part of building the Hamilton that, 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 that you believe in. I mean, it, it's so clear. I go back to, that's why I applied. Um, do the research here. I can't believe you don't have 25 people talking to you. You should, because this, this is a gem. Um, I'll, I'll take time to do a question. Um, one thing the board has been focused on and in, in one of our uh, future ready uh, things with uh, efficient operations is our blueprint 2030 plan of facilities. Um, we have a billion dollars in deferred maintenance. Um, don't know how you ended up today, but you went to Tyner Middle and CSLA, <laughs> um, two, two of our worst uh, facilities uh, that are getting new schools. Um, thankfully, but what what has been in your roles in Orange County and in uh, Las Vegas um, with facilities and facility management and operations? Okay, so in Orange County, I worked with student enrollment, um, and and that may seem very disconnected from facilities and construction, but I was also involved early on with the passage of a half penny sales tax that our community in the first year we passed it passed it 73 percent. Just prior to my leaving, they repassed it again at 87 percent. The way we were able to do that was by being excellent stewards of the fiscal dollar and being transparent, which you do an excellent job of. Um, the community was willing to step up and say, not only will we fund the refurbishment of our schools, but now that we're done, we see the next level that have to be done. What I love about um, 20, 2030 is it's clear, it's concise, it provides a list. Um, I remember being at a school when the list was first determined, and I didn't like being 138th. It was not, it's not where I wanted to be. It's not where my community wanted to be. But we saw the progression over time. And as we learned, and you've figured this out in a couple of your school buildings already, as you've learned there's opportunity to save money, then those dollars can be reappropriated and projects can be green lighted faster. Um, I heard that today talking both those principals. They know where they are on the list and they're glad where, they're where they are. They're, they're, they're pretty soon. Um, but I would imagine that no matter where a principal or a community is amongst the 79, if I have that number accurately, um, if I'm number 79, at least I know where I stand. And I know how that was devised. And if you read the study carefully, you understand why I'm number 79 and not number one. I'm not saying that everybody listening tonight loves that number, um, but the methodology is clear about how that was determined. Um, the other aspect of what I did in Clark um, we had an interesting opportunity this legislative session, probably the most successful session we've ever had. Um, I'd like to credit, credit somebody you know, who I work with, Dr. Brad Keating. He's my government relations guy who reports directly to me. But we set out a very bold proposal. We passed both of our board members' um, proposals. We're allowed to submit two pieces of legislation every year. One was about unfunded mandates and clearing up some of the stuff that the state government asks you to do that you have no money to do and they don't pay for. Mm -hmm. um, so you're clear on that. I saw the smiles. The other mm -hmm. one was related to connectivity in our community because that's the one thing COVID taught us was we needed something like your gig 2.0, you, you know, you, the gigabyte that, that every home and community here can have. Um, I'm using some information that I received as early as today. 
Um, the other thing we passed was the teacher pipeline. Um, that allowed us to um, allow paraprofessionals and teachers to, who are growing into the profession to stay employed even though they aren't doing their regular job. So if I'm a paraprofessional doing a teacher prep, my year of student teaching, I still collect my paraprofessional money because you can't recruit somebody if you're going to take their paycheck away from them. It, it's very difficult. And you're doing excellent work in those areas as well. I bring you to this. Um, we went to the state legislature to pass the bond referendum. And I'll be candid, and I'm sure people from Las Vegas are tuned in. We didn't think we had the ability to go to the public to get it. So we asked the governor, who's running for re-election, he wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Um, but we built a coalition amongst the legislature. We went to the Democratic side of the House and the Republican side of the House. We found sponsorship. And at the end of the session, they passed a $1.3 billion, um, sorry, $3.3 billion um, bond referendum for Clark County over the next 10 years. We're doing the same thing you're doing. Enlisted the help of a company. We we're developing the methodology. Because what happened in Clark was we grew, I wasn't there then, we grew so fast, all they could do was keep building, 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 building. And those schools in the middle that are 20, 30, 40 years old, they had no money to go back to them. Now we have the money to go back in and renovate, change HVACs, get the air quality where it needs to be, build new buildings where the building has lived its lifespan. That's what you have set up and imagine what's possible in Blueprint 2030. It's, it's exactly what a school system needs to do. And um, the next superintendent and, and the next school board and school board members, depending on elections and, and your own personal choices, you know, it, it's not going to be perfect, but it's a plan. And if it's executed correctly and transparent, then what you're going to see on the other side is the same thing we saw in orange. People respect when money is spent, spent correctly. They understand how it was spent. And, and then they, they might just be willing, especially as student achievement and buildings improve, to say, hey, we probably need to get behind, even deeper behind the school system. Thank you for that. Ms. Hill? I promise this is my last one. I just <laughs> chuckled. Um, this is a question I ask often in interviews. If you could have any animal, uh -oh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care if it's alive, I don't care if it's mystical, mi magical, extinct, mythical, thank you. If you could have any animal, only miniature, what would you have and why? It's the second really great question you asked me today. Um, Maybe he knows. Maybe he's Maybe thought about he it all day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I believe that integrity and trust start with being honest. So I have not thought about it. Um, and what I'm struggling with is the miniature part. I kind of picked my animal, but now I don't know why I want them to be so small. The miniature piece to me would be so that I could carry it with me. Um, I, I would share with you this personally. I'm a long, I, I don't look it. I once mailed a package as a resupply box as a long distance backpacker and the lady who took my box said, you don't look like a backpacker. Um, I, just, I didn't know exactly what to say. I said, you're probably right, I don't. Um, but I'm a long distance backpacker. So when you hike 220 miles, everything you put in your backpack has to have multiple purposes or, or have a reason to be in there. And the smaller, the better. The lighter, the better. So I think I would miniaturize it in order to continue to be able to carry it with me to keep it in my pocket. Um, I, I am a dog lover. Um, I have an Australian shepherd, Levi, who is, I don't know that I'll be able to, ooh, I don't know that I'll be able to replace him. Um, but there's aspects of his intelligence, he, like I can say, Levi, go pick up your toys. And he runs around the house and he picks up all his toys and he puts them in the basket. He's better than my kids. Um, <laughs> um, and he's smart. We, we, we throw the ball up on the top ledge of the former house and he used to run up and catch it and drag, drag it back down. Then he realized, I got, this, I got this plan. I'll go up and get it and I'll just drop it back down the steps. 
because dad will get up from the couch, pick it up and throw it back up there again. And, um, but there's just a functionality of the intelligence of that animal that reminds me that all of our children are smart and intelligent. Intelligence comes in various forms. It's not always academic. It's not always algebra or chemistry. Sometimes it's a stringed instrument. Sometimes it's a gift on a football or basketball court. Sometimes it's poetry. It, it just, but every single child I met and saw today has the ability to reach their full potential. And I think keeping Levi in a miniature in my pocket would remind me that all children have intelligence and intelligences, and it's our job to figure out what they are and allow them to bring those to fruition. That's the best I got. <laughs> We've all got that question from Jenny, and there was always a long pause. I didn't uh, catch it in any of the board meetings. I, I wish you had asked that way. question more publicly. Well, she's asked me, I think last year at TSBA or two years at TSBA, she got us at dinner one time. We were all just uh, dumbfounded. Like no? <laughs> um, any other questions? I mean, I'm doing, not doing my duty. Of, I don't have anything else from uh, YouTube. Um, so with that, I appreciate uh, you um, being in town, being of Thank interest you. in our district. Um, and hopefully you got to tour our district today, learned some stuff, saw the things that we have to offer for our students, um, and that we um, we're on the up and up, and, and we are looking for our next leader. Um, so with that, uh, if there's no other questions, uh, we'll end this. Um, and then for the public's sake, we have uh, Dr. Dawson um, on Thursday uh, and Dr. Robertson on uh, next Tuesday. So with that, thank you all for being here. Thank you for watching on YouTube. Um, and if you want more information on Dr. Bernier, under the superintendent search um, tab on our website is his resume, cover letter, and all that stuff. So thank you.